with uh, the British Orthopedic Association and women in orthopedics worldwide, uh, myself, uh, Camilo Dematos, uh, would like to welcome you to this really interesting uh, webinar. Um, Camilla, any comments uh, from you? No, I am also, I'm very happy to be here and to have this uh, great panel international and to discuss something that is uh, not, um, it's not the, the most uh, common uh, topic, we can say. Um, so we thought it would, it, it's such an interesting topic, uh, this idea of career breaks and how to bounce back after a break. And whether you're planning to take time off or not, sometimes you will be personally affected by something that requires unplanned time off uh, and how, how to manage that. So on the webinar today, we'll be talking about uh, both planned and unplanned career breaks, things like um, a planned sabbatical, uh, a research year, parental leave in various forms, both for men and for women, um, extended vacation, and then, you know, more personally disturbing uh, at times, either injury or illness of yourself or a family member. We'll talk a little bit about some of the stressors for our taking a break. Uh, what are the coverage issues? Whose responsibility is that to manage the coverage issues for your practice? What's the effect on your reputation for taking time off? Um, and, and is there a gender difference related to that? Uh, the finances of taking time off, what's the stigma um, for taking time off? And, and how does it affect someone's career trajectory if they're in an academic uh, path? There's also separate stressors for returning and bouncing back from a career break related to, depending on the time that you were off, what the level of competency you might feel uh, returning after an extended period. Um, has your position or role changed in the interim? Um, has your schedule need to be modified um, because of your own personal perhaps limitations in returning uh, from injury? And then we also, as we were planning and discussing uh, with the panel this webinar, there's a wide variety of parental leave policies in orthopedics around the world, anywhere from uh, two weeks to a year. And I think we'll hear from uh, various speakers uh, about um, this important policy and, and how it is seen in different countries. I'll turn it over to you, Camilla. Yes, uh, so for, for this uh, talk, we have an international panel. We're very happy uh, to have you all here and thank you for, for talking with us in this uh, very important topic. Uh, so from the UK, we have Zoe Little that is going to talk uh, uh, on a return to work, uh, return to work program for orthopedics uh, that um, it's uh, very important in the UK. Uh, Udo Aniehe is going to talk about returning to work after parental leave, so it's a, a female perspective from Nigeria. Uh, Olof Lindin from Sweden is going to talk of returning to work after parental leave, a male perspective, and also a, a little bit on research leave. And uh, Scarlett McNally uh, from the UK is going to talk about returning to work after illness. And, but before that, we're having the, our keynote speaker, the great Deborah Eastwood to talk uh, with us uh, with uh, her talk, which is called a challenging change. So welcome Deborah, and thank you for having us. Thank you. So, Thank you so much for inviting me to talk uh, and to join uh, Women in Orthopedics Worldwide and the International Orthopedic Diversity Alliance. So, oh, goodness, after all our practices, has that gone wrong? <laughs> no, it looks great. Uh, okay. we'll, we'll take away our pictures and let you have the screen. Sorry, okay. <laughs> ah, practice makes perfect, maybe. So the topic of my talk today is a little bit about challenging uh, change. I have to warn you, I, on the whole, I don't do change. When my colleague and I were offered a larger, brighter, less cluttered office, we actually said, no thanks, we'll stay put. And yet, despite the fact I don't do change, I've chosen a specialty where change is inevitable. The process of growth is at the heart of what I do, and my patients change from the embryonic life through childhood to young adulthood, and of course, beyond. 
Overall, I have to say, medicine has been very good to me. It's guided my growth from a ch shy child who was mortally afraid of blood through the joys of training at home and two spells abroad for fun into my consultant post via a bit of time off doing research. Medicine has also supervised my transition from an adult largely trauma practice back to the true roots of orthopedics, the care of the child. Throughout my career, I have been lucky enough, privileged enough indeed, to have always felt supported and always part of the team. Back in 2018, at the tail end of our centenary year, at the BOA meeting, we were celebrating 100 years of the British Orthopaedic Association. We made the link that we were also celebrating 100 years of women having the vote in the UK. And that made me think, because also in that year, when we had the British Orthopaedic Association Council elections, we had four new members on council, all good men and true, but all one demographic. And it made me realize that the hashtag I look like a surgeon for the BOA council included myself and the patient representative, but otherwise everyone was much of a muchness. Good, but not a real diversity in demographic. And that came as a little bit of a surprise to me because in my world of pediatric orthopedics, a group of people together looked like this. There was diversity all over the place. And this photograph where there were too many women uh, for the stage, the photographers thought this would be a simple, straightforward, small group of women, but they hadn't realized how many of us there were. And in that group, there were the presidents of EPOS, the European Society and the North American Society. So it made me wonder what has been the progress. So in the 1991, the Royal College of Surgeons said that 3% of our consultant body were women. When I was appointed a little bit later, that made, made it 4%, still not very good. And by 2020, we were up to 13.2%. And everyone says that's appallingly bad, and I agree it's bad. But it is a threefold increase over my career time, which is not good. But there has been an incremental change year on year. And as long as that continues, I am looking for change and seeing progress. This is another graph that in the UK is shown everywhere. And it is a terrifying graph because not only is trauma and orthopedics the worst specialty in terms of percentage of female consultant surgeons, we keep advertising the fact that we are the worst, which I don't think is necessarily a very enticing way of bringing trainees into the picture. And what I'd like to say is that it is changing and it will not change overnight, but it is changing. In the NHS in 2021, there are 2,654 consultants. So 7% of those 191 are female. But if we want to change that, if we simply want to go from seven to 8%, I mean, that's hardly a big leap, but we need an additional, an additional 26 female appointments needed over the next 12 months. So is that possible? Well, thankfully it is, because step by step, the number of trainees who are women is also increasing. And although the blue bar to the gray bar represents a decade, from the orange bar to the gray bar represents just one year. So certainly at our registrar resident level and at consultant level, that incremental change is still taking place. It is interesting to note that at the core training, the really basic level entry into our surgical training program, 2019 was a great year, 2020 was not such a good year, but there was a lot about 2020 that wasn't very easy. So change challenges. Way back in the last century when I was a trainee, I was one of the boys, but I drank a half pint and not a full pint. And therefore I was different, and actually over the year or so, the first year or so as a trainee, I found that more of the men were actually drinking half pints too, because we didn't need to all be macho and drink a pint at a time. But in that last century, when I was one of the boys, I was part of the team. It was an all white team, embarrassingly now, and it was almost all male, I being the sole exception. 
But we need to challenge our perceptions as well when I look at things like that, because this is a pie chart, which is one of the big training rotations in London. And we look at the large amount of orange and the little amount of blue, and you wonder what that pie chart shows. Well, if you think that it shows that 19% of our trainees are women, you would be right. And that is of all ethnicities. But interestingly enough, on this same rotation, if I show you this graph, but I say that the blue pie, part of the pie, represents the white males who are trainees. So when I started, there was nothing but white males. And now white males represent only 19% of our current trainee representative body. And that is a change. So we are much more diverse. And I wonder if that means that it's a little bit more challenging for all concerned. Because for some, their world has turned upside down. They thought they were in one specialty and now they're in a different specialty and much more diverse in terms of gender, culture and ethnicity. So I wonder, are they challenged? Are they on the edge or maybe even outside of their comfort zone? Because some of the stories that I hear these days about how people are treated is really very upsetting, disappointing and frightening. And I truly believe that for some of us in my generation back in the day, we maybe did have an inclusive, more open and less threatened or threatening environment. And I wonder if we were a kinder generation. So I think that sometimes in life, when the treatment of a slipped capital femoral epiphysis seems to be causing lots of problems now, and it wasn't causing problems back in the day, we have to go back and see what's changed. And in gaining something, maybe we've lost something. So I wonder if we've lost the art of kindness during this change. And change does challenge, and this hype cycle is here for any new te uh, technology or implant. So maybe it's the same for diversity. We triggered the change. We have far more diversity now than we did. And maybe we've hit that peak of inflated expectation. We thought that simply having more people around who were different, maybe that was just all we needed. And then everything would be miraculously better. But maybe it just caused more of an upset than we've realized. So I hope that we're not gonna go too far down the trough of disillusionment before we find the slope of enlightenment and come back to what we know is a happy state. Because we do want to avoid change for change's sake. That is true. And my big boss, sorry, my big boss, my old boss, uh, Tony Cattrall, made me realize that you must understand the natural history of a condition first before you start interfering with it. Because treatment should alter this for better, not for worse and not just for the sake of change. So similarly, if we're gonna change our working uh, environment, we need to make sure that we understand what that change is going to look like and what upset, if any, it will cause. Because it will be for the better, but it will be upsetting process perhaps whilst we change. So that not all change is good, not all change is easy. And these part-time trainees are often perceived to be not here when you need them. So maybe we need, in fact, we definitely need to adjust our perceptions, not our expectations of good care, but our perceptions of how we can deliver good care when everyone is working a little more flexibly or a little differently than they used to do. So we, when we're challenging change, we need to perhaps think of new words and have a new understanding of what this new workforce and working patterns look like. In the UK, if you're not quite up to hitting the targets, you get a training extension. And I wonder if that sort of implies that there is a little bit of a failure along that line. You extend your training because you haven't been able to keep up. We call it out of program when you have maternity leave or go into research. And again, I'm not sure that that's perhaps the best phrase. I don't know what the best phrase is, but I wonder if that's not it. Similarly, less than full-time training. This is a new term in the UK. I don't like the term less than. We're all type A surgeons. We're used to being more than. And I know we can't all be more than average or better than usual, but we maybe less than full-time training is not quite the phrase we want. 
And we used to call it flexible trading. We flexed up, we flexed down. We flexed to deliver service, we flexed to deliver training and learning. And I personally would like to see a much more individualized training program for each and every one of our trainees. Because a more diverse workforce will work differently. We do know that there are different patterns of learning and achieving. We have to look at confidence versus competence. We all know all of this. And in the UK, as Zoe will be telling you later, we do have a supported return to training program where that returning to training can be for any reason. And here at the BOA, we've heard a lot about a study which the proper results are going to be reported later, but the effects of gender on operative autonomy in surgical training. And of course, the training uh, numbers or the training progress, the training curve for the men is a little different for those for the women. It's a little different if you've been out of program for a while to those who have never been out of program. But you know what? We all get there in the end and we get there at about the same pace. So if we're challenging for change and changing direction, you have to accept and understand that that does usually take time. But annoyingly, unlike with COVID, it can happen overnight. So we have to be aware and recognize the chance for change when perhaps a simple feather touch will upset the balance and you can be changing direction and achieving what you want to achieve. Because otherwise you maybe have to have a really detailed plan. If you want water to go uphill or change direction, you can build a dam, but it, it had better be well planned. You could use the Archimedes screw principle to bring the water up a hill, but these require planning and total care and they take time. Whereas I like the raindrop effect where persistence overcomes resistance. I know this umbrella isn't, just, isn't saving you from every raindrop and these raindrops will get round the umbrella and the, sea, uh, sorry, the pavement will get wet. The dripping tap will carry on dripping and wasting water unless you collect it. And when you've got a bucket full of water, you can maybe throw it over the person who's holding you back. And with every drop of rain or every drop of water, there is that ripple effect. And eventually persistence will overcome resistance. So I don't read the right books to talk about managerial change, but Audrey Hepburn said that if you're achieving change, nothing is impossible. You simply add an apostrophe between the I and the M and impossible becomes I'm possible. And that's something that has guided me through much of my career. And if we're challenging to bring about change, we have to be prepared. We have to muck in and get the ball rolling. We sometimes need to shame people from inaction to action. But in terms of gender diversity, I truly feel we are pushing against an open door at the moment. And so we have a golden opportunity to take others through that open door with us and not leave them behind. So promoting change is both, uh, fatigue, sorry, is both demanding and fatiguing, which is why we need friends. But our ability to change, adapt, evolve, and reevaluate allows us to achieve. It's exciting and inspiring. It has indeed been a challenge to get our honorary fellowship award from the BOA to you, Christy. But it's a challenge that I've you know, accepted gracefully and I will make sure that we deliver it in person sometime very soon. So Great Ormond Street tells me to put my patients first and always. Stanmore Hospital tells me we should do excellence in all we do. The BOA asks me to care for patients and support surgeons and the IODA and WOW want me to promote diversity, equity and inclusion to empower and advance women. So I am proud and humbled to be your colleague in this challenging, changing world. Thank you. This was a wonderful, wonderful talk, Deborah. Thank you very much for this. My pleasure. Very inspiring, really. So I guess we can uh, call our first uh, uh, speaker, uh, first panelist to challenge change. <laughs> Is it Zoe? Yes, perfect. 
So you have the floor. Hello. Uh, thank you so much to IODA and uh, for inviting me to speak to about the work, return to work programme for orthopaedic trainees that we've set up and to the BOA for recognising the importance of this issue and its relevance to improving equity and diversity in our specialty. I'd like to tell you about the supported return to training programme that we have in England for all trainee doctors and the workshop that we have set up that is specific to orthopaedic returners. I hope you'll feel inspired to help improve the experience for others returning to work after time out for whatever reason and wherever in the world you are. There are around 1100 orthopaedic trainees in England in any given year, around 25% of whom are women. Approximately 36 trainees will be out of training in each year for a period longer than three months. This equates to 10% of the female orthopaedic trainees and 2% of male trainees. Parental leave is the most common reason taken by around 20 trainees each year. And um, this is followed by research and career breaks. On average, women take around nine months of parental leave and men six months, but this remains low in orthopedics and the UK as a whole beyond the standard two weeks of standard uh, paternity leave. Research leave is typically around two years, but some of this will still involve exposure to clinical practice and career breaks average around eight months. The return to work period invokes positive emotions, returning to the specialty and craft that we love, making a valuable difference to the lives of our patients, enjoying banter with our colleagues and regaining a major part of our identity. But it can also lead to reduced self-confidence, worries about making correct decisions in a timely fashion, fade of operative skills, concerns about not being up to date, wondering how to juggle work with new responsibilities and fears about returning to a less familiar work environment with new rules and regulations thanks to the pandemic. I'm sure we can agree that this outdated approach to returning to work does nobody any favours, least of all our patients, although it was not until 2018 in England when a better strategy started to become more mainstream. In light of the Hadiza Bauer Garba case, Support, Supported Return to Training, is an initiative set up by Health Education England, which aims to help trainees who have been out for more than three months reintegrate into training and get back up to speed by providing an individualised return package. The trainee works with their educational supervisor to include various different elements, including an enhanced supervision period, attendance at refresher courses, mentoring, coaching, and funding for conferences, workshops, and other courses. This has really taken off in paediatrics, anaesthetics and GP, where there are large numbers of trainees taking time out and popular spe specialty specific workshops and refresher courses have evolved over time. Until our first workshop, which was in October 2020, there was no TNO specific programme. Our programme was pioneered by Shirley Chan, a general surgeon in Kent and champion for the surgery support programme in her region with help from the team at Health Education England and designed and delivered by myself and three other registrars who had experience of returning from time out of training. In planning the workshop, we reflected on the positives and negatives of our own experiences and used these to shape the programme. The first workshop ran alongside the regional induction for new registrars with a separate breakout session in the afternoon. This did allow us to include some practical sawbone skills sessions but we felt that the workshop would work better as a completely separate entity to allow a safe space for clinical discussions when trainees were perhaps feeling a bit rusty compared to some sprightly new registrars and for closer peer supports. The COVID restrictions in March 2021 took us to a fully virtual format, which is our preferred option going forward. We designed a one day interactive workshop with two main components, peer support and a clinical refresher. We had seven participants and asked them to keep their cameras on during the sessions, which improved the interactions. We started with everyone introducing themselves, including talking about the reasons they had taken time out of training if they felt comfortable to share that, and facilitated discussions about aspirations and concerns people had about returning to training. Those of us who had returned previously shared our experiences and offered potential solutions for difficulties that arose. Shirley Chan gave us an introductory talk about the support programme and how to arrange the enhanced supervision period. We shared tips on returning to on-calls, how to navigate and arrange less than full-time training, and some tips on how COVID was impacting on day-to-day -day working life as an orthopaedic trainee and how to navigate those. 
The clinical refresher was comprised of interactive case-based discussions in the style of a fracture clinic, mock trauma meeting, and on-call emergency cases. And we also delivered a concise talk on updates to orthopedic guidelines, including the latest boasts. We have now had 15 participants and excellent feedback for the clinical as well as networking and peer support elements. The virtual format was surprisingly well received and allowed us to have participants from all over the country whilst maximising convenience by eliminating travel, minimising costs and potential childcare difficulties for those returning from parental leave. The workshop we have designed is just one small element of the return to work programme and I think there is a lot to be done to improve trainees experiences beyond what can be achieved in a one day webinar. Taking time out affects significant numbers of trainees, although they are generally quite widely spread around the UK at any one time. Taking the time out needs to be normalised, as does recognising that returning to work can be difficult for the reasons I mentioned earlier. We need to increase uptake of the support programme, which we are lucky to have access to, but also ensure that it is delivering the goods for orthopaedic trainees. We would like to expand our workshop to include trainees nationwide and run it every six months. Some of our participants also wanted to have simulated practical skills sessions, but as they're quite widely spread apart, this is something that would probably be best achieved at a local or regional level. I'm very conscious of the fact that we have limited data on the impact of our workshops, and in a more general sense, there is not much out there about the effects of time out on, of training and parenthood on career progression and exam pass rates. I'll be interested to see um, the final data from the GHOST study. Data from the US looking at success at surgical board exams showed significantly lower pass rates in women who started their internship with children compared to women without and to men with and without children. Unfortunately, we don't have any comparable data from the UK, but it would not surprise me to find similar evidence of differential attainment based on family status or time taken out of training. I think that we need to study this in more detail so that we can understand the real significance of this issue make improvements and develop our return to strategies for orthopaedics to make sure they provide enough of the right support and ultimately help to narrow the attainment gap. The workshop will be running again next week and likely again in early 2022, depending on the demand. If you're currently out of training and you'd like to join us, um, please do get in touch. Um, likewise, if you have experience of time out of training and you'd like to help out or you'd like to set up your own workshop, um, we would also be happy to help. So please do get in touch. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Zoe. That uh, it's the difference between talking about something and doing something. Uh, uh, it looks like a wonderful program. I'll look forward to uh, questions from the audience uh, when we get to the Q and A. And I would encourage audience members to type in questions now, and we'll we'll have the panel at the end. I'd like to introduce uh, Udo Anyehi um, from Nigeria uh, next, who will share her slide. Um, is going to talk about um, returning to work after parental leave. It's, and it's great to have these opinions from around the globe uh, in commentary. It's wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for all that made IOD and WOW a reality. Um, I don't know if you can see my slides. We can't, but you can put in presenter mode. It's perfect. Great. Um, so I'll be talking about returning to work after parental leave. I must say that the term parental leave is not common in Nigeria because we don't have paternity leave, we have maternity leave. Um, but sadly, uh, there's none given to the men, it's just the women. And maternity leave in Nigeria is four months. The first month is supposed to be before the expected date of delivery, and then the three months taken after the baby has come. Now, once the maternity leave is over, you have, uh, for the next six months, uh, the mother has a uh, two hours in the work day to be able to go feed the baby, go attend to the baby. Uh, so most people, because the work hours are usually from eight o'clock to four o'clock, most people tend to take the two hours at the end. So we have them working from eight to two o'clock. So I'm going to start with um, giving some personal mistakes I made and then go on. Uh, number one, assuming the babies follow a pattern. 
they don't. So he's not asking for help from colleagues. And then when you have to pray for like six hours in a day, instead of 24 hours, then you know you're doing something wrong. Not eating healthy, being stressed up that I had to prematurely wean my babies earlier on. And not because I stopped breastfeeding, but because the baby was like, okay, I'm done with you. You're not giving me the attention I needed. And then finally, no family planning. I had my kids like um, Doremi Faso in that order, my first four kids, and that was a huge problem. Now, returning to work after maternal, maternal leave is actually very tough. Number one, you're not ready to leave a three-month-old baby and then return to work. In When I started, that was during my residency program, there was no work-based crutch at all in the hospital. So it's uh, um, leaving the baby without breastfeeding was an issue. Okay, so that becomes a problem. Now, sleep deprivation, fatigue, because I do not know why, but why babies tend to feed at night. So you have problems getting enough sleep. So that's another issue. And then by the time you're ready to get back to work, that inertia for work is there. You, don't, you just don't feel like it. Worst, what, what the worst part is having to take overnight calls. That's a problem. Reading, it's a big problem. But is there a solution? Yes, there is a solution. But I was must say that there's no one approach that fits all. It's individualized, depends on your home and your institutional circumstances. So what I'm going to do here is like give some practical tips and then modify to suit your situation. So you have three months after the baby has arrived. Um, so if you have six months, you have 12 months, you can just divide it into three. Basically, the first month for us is like you pay full attention to your baby. That's the ideal thing that should be done. To the home, you should get enough rest, get enough food. Luckily in Nigeria, we have a family support system that is present once you've had your baby. Uh, in the Igbo language, it's called omogwa. And what that means is that it's an unwritten rule that your mother comes to look after you when you've had your baby. So she takes care of the baby, you feed the baby, you hand the baby over to her, and then she burps the baby, puts the baby to sleep, gives it, cooks for you, helps you with the washing. If she's not there, your mother in law can come around or some family member must come. So we usually have that family support at least for the first few months. Now, the second month is or the second period, the second stage, whichever one, it's ideal that you should be more active start getting curious about hospital activities and that's what I tend to do so that way you're not that lost when you get back to work. Now the third month is the planning phase and that's where I'm going to talk about this transition period. Now this period you should ideally start concluding your exclusive breastfeeding. Um, back then because like I said there was no crutch so the plan is either to express breast milk and then leave it for the baby. But you know in Nigeria we have issues of power. So instead of having still milk for your baby, you may as well start formula early. So you start completely the breastfeed and then breastfeeding and then start on baby formula. Okay. Now getting help is mandatory at this point in time. Get a nanny, get a, a living um, help or, or someone that will be there for you. Now it's important that you bring this help early. Like two weeks, three weeks before you have to get back to work. So the person gets used to the baby gets used to the house, the system, how you feed the baby, what you do and all that. And if you don't have facility, if you're not able to get a help or a nanny, then get involved with a crutch or a daycare center. And of course, the early crutch start is also very important. You must do that like two or a week before you start work. So you can just drop the baby off at the uh, crutch, register the baby there, of course, drop the baby, maybe go shopping for one or two hours, just so that you get used to being without the baby and then baby also gets you to a new environment. It's important that this period to be organized. Buy your baby needs, feeds up front, get things ready so that if the nanny or whoever is going to be there will be able to know oh, where there's not when you're in theater, someone calls, oh, we run out of formula or one thing or the other, it's important. And if you have other kids, you must plan. Uh, for me, I had four kids during my residency program. I have five kids, by the way. I had four kids during my residency program. And school run is a big deal back home and so what i did was my priority where i was going to leave is close to a school so if you can just walk to the school and walk back so that took care of that and again very important is you must take a peek at work at this transition period it's important to take a week a peek at work take a peek into your books because you're reading you have to pass your exams so so that you don't just um get forced into work without being prepared look in and see what's going on at work luckily now because of covid i have online lectures Almost every day there's one online lecture or the other. So key into that, you can be breastfeeding and key into that in your, your last month before you get to work is very important. And that helps you to, to sort out of that inertia um, that comes with having to start work. Okay, now work begins, you're already setting a support system at home or at the crutch. You're returning to work energized for action. It's important that you eat healthy, 
do not skip your meals, keep hydrated. And when you get back, try to sleep early because you need to eat. One way or the other, like I said, babies tend to wake up at night so that you can have the energy to be able to, be able to read even as you're attending to the baby as well. Leave the cleaning up to the help, but still remain active, your exercises. Now, at work, study your schedule. Communicate your plans and challenges with your colleagues. There's nothing wrong in seeking for help from them. Discuss with them your emergency call schedule and then seek support. It's important. You also should be prepared for sicknesses. I mean, sickness, sickness, can, sickness can occur with a baby, with yourself. Anything can happen. Okay, so you also need to be uh, prepared. In Nigeria, we need to advocate certain institutional policies. How did you have on-site breastfeeding facilities or on-site crutch in institutions, whether hospitals, um, many other establishments that is really lacking and i think we need to talk about that and then um, advocate for such paternity leave it's important that the men it's important that the men have uh, I'm sorry about that. it's important that the men have paternity leave um, even if it's two weeks it's important that they have this close bonding time with their own um, kids Finally, to conclude, family is the priority, but please plan. Child spacing, like I said, is key. And you must realize that you're not in competition with the men. So you're going to have lots of time if you're having lots of babies, but you know it's your own race. You're not competing with the men. Let them go. They go ahead of you, but you still catch up at your own time. Get help, get help, get help. So if you have to get two, that will be fine. Engage the support of colleagues. Don't be, don't shy away from asking for help. Don't say, don't feel like, okay, I can do it. I know how many people that ask for my help, that ask to help me. And I'm like, no, don't worry, I can do it. But that put a lot of stress on me. So please engage the support of your colleagues. Whenever they ask for help, ask to help, allow them to help. And then plan the transition phase. And I tell you, you have a fulfilling work, study, and family um, balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Udo. This was a wonderful and very practical uh, talk. I, I wrote down a few questions that I'm, I want to ask you at the end of it. Uh, but right now we'll continue uh, with our panelists and now with the mayoral perspective of parental leave, uh, my colleague from Sweden, Olof Lindien, is going to talk about parental leave and also about uh, a, a little bit about research leave. Welcome, Olof. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to join you from Sweden. You can turn your camera on. Love. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Here I am. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you. And uh, here is the presentation. You can see it as well, I hope. Uh, all right. So um, my name is Olaf Lindén. I'm a uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon in Lund, uh, Skåne University Hospital. And I'm here to talk to you about returning to work after parental and research leave, and it's the male perspective here. Uh, and also the perspective from, from uh, uh, a quite unique place in the world, I think, in terms of parental leave. Um, this is the reason I've been away. Uh, I'm in my second leave. Uh, two children, Ilva and Sixten, three years and one years old. Uh, I have to give to you a little bit of the background. The Swedish social insurance is uh, uh, quite unique, I think, in, in terms of parental leave. You get a total of 16 months of paid leave, uh, where three months is reserved for each parent. And during this time, you get a child allowance, uh, almost 80% up to a certain level from the government. And uh, many workplaces, including uh, public hospitals, will top that up to almost 90%. You even get an equality bonus of £1,000 if you share uh, the time uh, uh, equally uh, between the parents. And uh, typically children will start kindergarten at one, uh, or one, uh, I think more often one and a half year of age. So there's a lot of time to, to share in, uh, in the couple uh, without uh, taking time off from the, uh, stealing time from the mother and child in the beginning. Uh, well, my time off, I took uh, with the first child, I took six months full time off, and then I had six months of part time research, teaching, and child leave. And now, now I'm in my second uh, uh, child leave, uh, it's a total of nine months full time, and I will be back after New Year. 
And uh, from my first round, I, I remember it was uh, uh, quite scary to think about coming back. And uh, uh, luckily for me and in my department, it's uh, uh, a very good support from my colleagues and my senior colleagues. And uh, I remember that after one or two weeks, it was like I was never gone. And I guess this is uh, because of the, the workplace attitude that I felt had that smooth transition. Um, I don't think I gain anything like uh, in, you know, operating room skills from uh, being home with my children, but uh, uh, I certainly think I gain a lot of uh, uh, things in a, a personal uh, or family uh, perspective and perhaps also some professional skills uh, uh, because it's um, it certainly is a challenge to be home with small children uh, as everyone uh, knows who's tried that so i hope that is something that uh, uh, i can use uh, when i get back especially with, uh, working with uh, children and families so in sweden we have this extremely generous system but uh, uh, we haven't shared it equally uh, over time, but I feel a change coming now for the last decade that, that male colleagues will use more of their uh, parental leave time. I don't think we're up to 50-50, but uh, typically uh, my colleagues will, my male colleagues will take uh, six months off and often more. And this uh, is because of a change in workplace attitudes, and I guess it leads to a change in workplace attitude as well. And uh, what we see is less difference between male and female uh, colleagues in terms of lost experience. And that, I think, creates more harmony in my department, at least. Uh, you don't feel that you, you lose anything uh, while being away because it's something that uh, not everyone, but all, all the people with their families will experience. And in Sweden, I think we will look back at the time where we didn't share the, the responsibility with, with uh, children equally uh, and think it was strange in the future. It's only uh, 100 years since we had the first uh, uh, election in Sweden with women. So uh, uh, that's all. Uh, maybe I can answer some questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ulof. Uh, uh, it's good to have your perspective. It's going to be very interesting in the question uh, section. We're going to leave the questions uh, at the end. So we have still uh, Scarlett Manali, so that is going to talk now on uh, taking time, uh, um, returning to work after uh, disease. So welcome, Scarlett. You have the floor. Thank you. Um... Um, I'm just going to show my screen and so bear with me for a moment. No worries. Um, can you? Yeah, just so we can see it, just uh, put on presenter mode and it's okay. Um, Perfect. Okay. Lovely. Sorry, we've got a funny view of me up from, um, uh, from, my, uh, from my laptop. Um, so I'm, I want to talk about returning to work after ill health. Um, I'm a consultant orthopaedic surgeon um, in um, Eastbourne, which is on the south coast of the UK. Um, and I've been there for nearly 20 years. I've got a picture that's about the only picture of me operating. That's when I was... Um, quite pregnant with my kid who's now 18. Um, and just to say, I've done some work around um, uh, careers and so forth in at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. So do look up at rcseng.ac.uk forward slash career for some of the um, pregnancy guidance and that sort of thing. And I did the expressing breast milk um, that's been talked about earlier. It's really lovely to be part of this, this panel. Um, uh, thank you. And this is also me. Um, I've just come off the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. I did uh, 10 years on, on that. Um, and now I'm, I'm back to work after ill health. Um, uh, there's me um, cycling to work. Um, and it's actually much easier as a consultant than as someone in training because we don't have that um, travel um, problems and all the exams and that kind of thing. 
and just to say operating really is lovely i did miss it um massively um and it, it's so lovely to be back um back in there working um do use the team um i've always when i when we do the team brief i say the stuff like i've been off for a while do you know if i look like i'm doing something stupid do you tell me um or i say how long i think an operation is going to take or i say this is a difficult case please don't all go on break during that case you know or something i try and um get the team to be on my side um and the clinics have they've always been too busy this is me um a few weeks ago uh and it's it, it, it's been it takes a bit longer getting through because uh, so much is computerized um and because the patients seem to think i'm nice and want to chat um and some of them haven't been out for a long while um but actually it's lovely to be back um absolutely lovely <laughs> Um, so the thing is, do you label yourself as being disabled? Um, I got all of these when I was first ill because I was catastrophically ill and having to travel quite a lot up and down to London for some specialist treatment. Um, and I made the one in the middle about no germs, please, low immunity, um, before there was even a pandemic uh, when I was first ill. Um, and I recommend people in the UK, you get one of these, uh, radar key. You can just um, Google it um, and you don't have to prove your disability, but sometimes you need the toilet and you can't get to the toilet. Um, and um, if you wave your key, they, you can you can open the, the disabled ones. Um, I've also started using one of these, which is um, a sunflower lanyard, which is what you wear if you have a disability. And actually it stops people being annoying when there's something, as I say, I travel a lot. So people then realize um, my folding bike isn't a bike. It's my means of transportation to get on the train, if you see what I mean. It, may, it, it smooths things out. It stops people being, um, being annoying. So you have to work out whether you want to be labeled as someone with a disability um, or not. Um, some tips. Um, I was actually catastrophically ill, as I said. And when I went back the first time, um, people i had people hugging me in corridors and you could see people with the tears in their eyes um because i'd actually been told that um i should take ill health retirement and told that um i, I wouldn't be going back to work it, it, um so they were really really pleased to see me which is nice and and you realize how how nice people are um the other thing is aiming for good not perfect um throughout my career it feels like as surgeons we're always pushing to go harder and better and, and whatever but actually there's a lot of surgeons out there that are a pretty average and sometimes you can just drop back a bit and so long as you're doing the right thing by the patients that's okay um it, it does require like anything else planning um planning to fit your exercise in because that's really important for your health the admin um the letters the booking your car in for a service the all that kind of thing that might take a little bit longer but you do need to plan it everyone should should plan it in um and also as someone who's who's you're still going i've got, still got ongoing chemotherapy and um, i have peaks and troughs in what i'm good at and i save stuff for myself so that if um if i'm on a train journey where i know i'll be tired i just sort out the references for something um and there are some letters that just go in the drawer and once a week i just empty out the drawer and sort them out so um it, you have to kind of adapt you can't, you can't be perfect all the time um and accept help and the other tip is in the UK, if you use the phrase reasonable adjustments, that scares the um, human resources managers, because that's a way of saying, I know that disability is a protected characteristic, and I know that you have to make reasonable adjustments for me coming back. Um, and if you don't, it's illegal. So that's um, a phrase to be use useful. Um, and I do recommend a phase return. It's um, so you go back kind of 20% of your hours, 25% the first couple of weeks and then 50% um, and then full time. But um, but you can go back on a, on a phased return, still get your full um, pay. Um, and I think you kind of need to be flexible because what you think you're going to do when you're sitting at home and you're um, kind of fielding lots of emails and I was doing lots of talks and writing and, and teaching and sorting out um, guidance and that sort of thing. Um, what my plan was for going back to work kind of wasn't really realistic um and and so sometimes you can go back you can change your mind and if there's any option to do what you're doing less than full time or part time i would recommend you do it i think life's too short you need all that spare time to do the admin and not to be frazzled that's a very old thing about a royal college surgeon thing the document on uh, flexible training from 20 years ago so it's been it's been around um for a long time 
Um, so I've got uh, myeloma, which is cancer of plasma cells in the bone marrow, and those are the ones that make um, antibodies. And in my case, they've made abnormal antibodies and they, um, the light chains, the antibodies circulate around, they're uh, not soluble, so they um, land somewhere and in me they've landed on, on my heart. Um, so my heart's very rigid, it's a kind of, um, it's like a cardiomyopathy, I, I, um, it doesn't. So I was diagnosed with absolutely crashing heart failure um, and then had to have chemotherapy to stop the myeloma, but it doesn't fix the heart. Um, and I've now developed um, osteoarthritis here, which is fine. Um, but this is in December 2018, as I said, I was told ill health retirement, you'll never go back. And that that was a paper saying basically 5% five, five year survival. Um, luckily, there's some papers showing amazing survival. So um, don't be worried about me, I'm fine. Um, I've, I had to change chemo because it wasn't wasn't working. But um, it was being a patient is, is an, a very a strange experience. Um, but I, in, interesting. Um, uh, and as I say, I've had excellent treatment. Um, I'm going to be on chemotherapy forever. It's every month now. So basically, I had 10 months off work, went back to work, you know, on the inc increasing for, for um, six months. Then the pandemic struck and I was clinically extremely vulnerable and told to go home. So I've been working from home for a bit. And then I had a stem cell transplant. So I donated my own stem cells and then um, uh, had was in a hospital for two and a half weeks, big um, chemo to get rid of all my stem cells, my own stuff, half of it put back because they might need the other half. Um, and um, and then, so I was actually quite nice for me, the pandemic, because I was sitting at home isolating anyway, I'd have had to be isolating anyway, and suddenly all my children came back to join me, and, um, um, you know, actually I was working as hard as I could because I was so guilty not being in work. Um, and my hip's playing up, so I'm going to have some time off um, next month for a couple of months um, to, to have a hip replacement. And I got a new job at the time because I thought I wasn't going back to clinical work because I was so ill. A de deputy director for the Centre for Perioperative Care, so cpoc.org.uk. It's about getting people through surgery better and using the team better. So please use the resources because the Royal College of Anaesthetists is, is, is um, kind of uh, paying a huge amount of money, um, not, not to me, but the whole centre, um, to get everything going so we get these beautiful resources. So look at it, cpoc.org.uk. And I did lots of work around getting people um, prehabilitated for um, operations, and it really does make a difference. It reduces complications by 30 to 80 percent if people do that. I've worked with Swim England on guidance about uh, health and swimming. Um, and some practicalities, the stuff you think about, like, you know, the laptop and, you know, can you do some of the, can you get a link in to work from from home? Um, you actually need extra time reviewing patients that someone else has put on the waiting list rather than um, yourself. Um, and the, my big uh, recommendation is limit the patients per clinic because that's the only thing you can control and it, you might need fewer patients per clinic. Uh, there's something the Academy of Medical Royal College has put out about uh, their recommendations for return to work. So, um, so you can look that up. Um, it's got a page of a checklist for going back to work. Um, so I'm going to have some more time off. That's my right hip. That's um, It was old karate um, injury, but the steroids haven't done it any favours. Um, but actually, I'm not the old me now I've gone back. Clinics, I find I'm a little too empathetic, um, so it takes a little bit longer. Or people think I'm nice or something. Operating is is straightforward. It's just like riding a bike. You read the operation before. If you haven't done it for one, you get on with it. It's, it's actually is actually fine. The difficult bit for me has been the um, the computers, the passwords, the updates, mandatory training I'm saving till I've got my um, uh, hip um, leave. You've got to plan ahead um, and you have peaks and troughs in energy. But do make time for everyone else. Um, that's my mother. We're, between lockdowns, we went out to the zoo. That's London Zoo. Um, and, and that was lovely. Um, and do fit in time, for, as I say, for your, for your exercise and, and plan a holiday. And I've already said, don't don't be perfect. You can't be perfect. No one's actually perfect. Um, just work out what your minimum standard is. And have something you say, because pa patients will ask you, staff will ask you, and you don't want to you just have, have a standard answer you give out. Um, um, and the best advice um, I got was from occupational health um, said, you know, if you're a footballer, just practice putting your boots on and then practice having a kick around before you go back to a big match. Um, so, as, as I say, my first plan wasn't realistic um, and you do need to kind of work it out together. And again, that's the problem I had with managers. They were incredibly helpful. Um, but the difficult bit is um, they would planned ahead and suddenly I got an email saying your job plan has been changed. And it's kind of they hadn't. There were other things I wanted to put in that were different um, and they tried too hard. Um, so it, it, they need to listen. Um, 
and I, I've been on and off steroids for a long time and, and steroids can make people very kind of binary, very everything's lovely or everything's dreadful. And I just warn people at managing other people um, just to be absolutely clear and fair and calm and listen. But there's something about having an invisible disability. It was invisible until I started using a walking stick um, because we see the things like people's skin colour or, or gender usually. Um, but everyone's a bit different. And once you make something so that it's normal for that for anyone to do that job, you know what the job involves, you it, it's good for everyone, um, if you see what I mean. So it's kind of working out what actually is needed for that job and what, whether that person can do it, irrespective of what they look like, um, should um, kind of push towards more diversity, more equity. And just to say that that thing I've I've helped my trust in the part in the past of many years ago helping with bullying investigations, because many people don't realise how they come over. And as I say, managers sometimes come over um, as telling someone what to do that they don't want to do. And the bullying in the UK is defined as how the victim feels rather than what was intended. So I do recommend people make a plan and listen together. And I've got stuff from the College of Surgeons um, on uncon avoiding unconscious bias, which can help um, that sort of thing. I've already mentioned reasonable adjustments. If you've got a trade union, use it because there are some things that can just ruin your day. When you have your morning clinic running into your afternoon operating list, it ruins your day. There are protected characteristics. If you're being discriminated against because of something, you're allowed to say something and get it changed. As I say occupational health were great. Um, there's something I haven't used, but practitionerhealth.nhs.uk is really helpful if people need emotional support and they're an NHS um, doctor. And for me, it feels a bit like being a woman surgeon. Sometimes when you're sometimes you have to kind of fit in or, or lean in or be more like the men. And sometimes you want to be able to be you. Um, and it's OK to do whichever you want on an individual basis. Obviously, we need to change the system so they're more inclusive. Um, but actually, sometimes you just need to fit in and pretend you're not different. Um, and that's OK. Um, so my secrets, um, I wear a wig um, because I didn't want to every time have a conversation with people about, oh, oh, um, you lost your hair, oh, I feel so sorry for you, you've had chemotherapy. It's like, it's okay, it's gonna grow back. Can we get back to talking about your ankle, please? I just want to, um, I just wanted to be me again. Um, and the other thing is, um, it's all very well being open, but I stopped being open when I applied for a role and didn't get it. And I asked someone why I hadn't got it. And they said, oh, well, um, we thought you'd been ill and you might be ill again and you need to rest. And we thought you might be taking some time off for a stem cell transplant. And that was at a time when I'd been told I was too sick for a stem cell transplant and I'd carry on with chemo forever. So that was a new me and I was good enough as my new me. But I was told I would, didn't get this role because of my disability. And I kind of started stopping talking about it then. And my final thing, this applies to UK consultants only. I'm really sorry. I've just come back to two of these brown envelopes basically saying that I've paid too much in pension uh, contributions or my pension pot's gone up too much and I'm going to have to pay a huge amount of tax and this is what's limiting now I'm wondering how many sessions I can drop even though it's a job I love to do and this is happening to all consultants and I thought I was immune because I'm, I'm, I'm part-time but but I'm not so that's it um, my big thing is be nice to your future self um, uh, some resources I worked on, um, but I'm not on there anymore, rcsng.ac.uk for slash study, for slash career, um, and or you can contact me uh, on Twitter at Scarlett McNally, um, DMs are open. Um, so, yep, that's it. I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully um, I can get my... Maybe we could have um, all of the panelists back. Um, I want to um, applaud all the panelists for their insights. Um, I also want to applaud, I'm not sure I've been on a webinar where we were perfectly on time. So we've, um, I mean, perfectly on time. So bravo. Um, we will uh, have a, a plenty of time for an interactive discussion. There are questions already in the chat that we can um, start with from the audience, but really encourage, we've got 30 minutes um, to really query these amazing speakers about their experiences, their their thoughts, um, and try to help the of you in the audience that are perhaps um, dealing or will deal with these types of um, career breaks. I just I just want to say one thing. I want to thank you, Scarlett, for being so uh, open and sharing uh, this with us. It, it's 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 very impactful to to hear what you said, and 
and very interesting to see how much you advocate for yourself. Uh, because I, I don't know, like we as doctor, when we have family members that are sick or uh, people that we know, we usually advocate for our family because we know the system. So we try to help them. But it's 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 very interesting to hear how you advocate for yourself and those those. How does it work? Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we look at the, oh, yeah, go ahead, Charlotte, please. I was going to say, I'm, I'm in a privileged position because they can't sack me. Um, you know, they, they, I'd really have to do something bad to sack me. You know, I'm a consultant. Um, so um, it's just adjusting and then working with your colleagues so they don't think you're um, you're making them work harder um, because you're doing more. So um, I, I appreciate it's different for people in different training positions or in a less... Um, stable job Deborah. yeah i think that's an important point isn't it i think there's a lot of worry about that if you can't do your job as it's planned and i agree it should be planned properly but that others are going to have to pick up the slack and i think that's the really difficult uh issue to deal with Should we start with the questions uh, from the uh, audience? We have a few. So the first is from Mari Fiard from, uh, uh, from South Africa. Regarding diversity and inclusion, we must be under no illusion that minority groups employed for this feel like a token. And this lack of confidence and feeling of inadequacy needs to be managed. It's also disheartening when I hear of talented black female surgeons wondering whether they belong or were just employed due to their color. Uh, they start on black, back foot, uh, even though it's their perception and not the truth. I think this is uh, regarding Deborah's talk. Um, so the question of, the, the, I think the topic of intersectionality is very important, talking with uh, what Scarlett talked uh, about disabilities and uh, especially those disabilities that are not visible and also other, characteristics that we have that impact the bias that we get in in the world. Deborah, what do you what do you have to say about Mari's uh, comment? Uh, so of course I have no personal experience so you could say uh, in we have this phrase the lived experience I haven't got that particular lived experience but I think we all, and I would say men and women, have imposter syndrome, which is what it's called now. And in my early days, we didn't have that phrase, but it is a perceived lack of confidence or a real lack of confidence or both. And you either hold it in and hide it or you share it and try and get support for it. And I think we're all a lot more open to that issue these days than we were. And I would like to think that we had enough supportive networks around your, your surgeons or your colleagues, Mari, that they would feel supported in what they were doing and that they had achieved their post under usual competition you know, rules and they were eligible or um, the right person for the job at that time. But I agree that's me just talking to talk, isn't it? Those who walk the walk might not feel like that. There's a question from um, Marie Taudo um, asking, did you find that your male colleagues were supportive once you had children? Yes, the male colleagues were actually supportive. Yeah, when I had kids, uh, they were pretty supportive, offering to help. Um, I was more like, um, no, I'm fine because I, did, I felt being away on maternity leave, I uh, had lots of work to do. Why would I also come back? And then they take, I mean, allow them to do the work. So they were very supportive at the end. Great to hear. We have one uh, to uh, Olaf in your country with uh, so much uh, paternity, maternity leave, also from Mari from South Africa. Who does the actual work in my country? when we have a finite number of trainees. So if one is away, the other have to work harder, pick up more shifts. Uh, how do you get it right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so if you both work in the hospital or, or 
What did she mean? No. I think I think she meant like uh, if you have to if maybe money wise and also uh, yeah. practical wise also I think maybe it's in, encouraging to hear uh, like at home cooking doing stuff uh, doing practical things. Right. Yeah. So so that's my job when I'm uh, in parents leave of course to do uh, more of that the practical work at home and in terms of of um, uh, uh, work. I mean, we, we get a lot of uh, uh, support from the government, so so of course you earn uh, much less. I, I'm not on call anymore and, and so much so on, so, so it's a lower salary, but you have to plan for that, I suppose. And in the uh, in the in the bigger picture, in in the societal level, I'm uh, I'm not sure that Sweden is very it, it's costing something, of course, but I, we hope we earn it in the future, in, in, uh, in, in when our children will grow up in a, in, a, in a good way, perhaps. Yeah, it looks like she's yeah she was specifically referring to the shifts, the work shifts, and and how your colleagues are able to that. Oh yeah, at work. Uh, so 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 it, if 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 your colleagues need to work more um, uh, at work because uh, you are away. Okay, I see. Uh, well, uh, they have problems. Uh, they they bring in, in extra people, and uh, we have uh, actually people coming from uh, other places in Sweden to uh, rotate in our hospital. So there is an issue, of course. But because this will happen all the time. It's something that we, the department, has to to deal with all the time. So, in a way, I think we're we're used to it. They're used to it. But of course, uh, my my boss is uh, uh, have some gray hairs when putting together the schedule. So I know that. But so, like, uh, since since we work in the same place, I can I can I can put my perspective for something that come that comes from a place that things do not work uh, did not work like this. Um, so. My my perspective here is that even though uh, they do have to work around the schedules, people do not work more. Uh, they it's harder to keep the schedules going, but it's not like you don't take extra shifts or extra uh, like uh, over hour overtiming at at work because someone else is away. Usually, uh, the schedule will work so everybody has like a normal shift uh normal amount of shift and normal uh, normal amount of working hours would you agree Olaf? that's correct right yes because some places people have to work more like take two uh two shifts instead of one etc yeah, i see yeah so i suppose we're we're fortunate in many ways yeah <laughs> What is it like um, not in Sweden, um, in the UK or uh, Nigeria, um, for people covering during that time? So this is where we haven't, in several training programs, we haven't got it quite right. So I know from three weeks ago, I know that my next resident will be part time. I've had four weeks warning that my workload will not be covered as I had expected it to be. And the expectation is that the other residents will just work harder, which is uh, diversity gone totally wrong. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, that if someone, and it's a male trainee who is going, who's going to be less than full time, so that's absolutely fine. But the fact that everyone should just work a bit harder is not fine. Now, this is very variable in the UK and it's something that's being addressed. But that it is, it is, it is difficult sometimes to juggle everything, and keep everything, uh, the training and the service commitment going. Udo, any any comments? Yeah, in Nigeria, the residents will have to work harder because you have ten people, and they now have nine. Yeah, that's how it is in the United States as well, for the most part. Um, when somebody's out, everyone works harder. I think that. I think it's about developing a culture that, yes, women will traditionally have the children, but as we develop more parental leave policies where men are taking off, and, and you know, Scarlett's example is, uh, 
a big wake up call, right? No one knows when they may be out, where they may get hit by a car, where they may have a debilitating illness. Um, so it can happen to anyone. It's not a woman's issue. It's not a maternity issue. It's a, it's an idea of, of keeping the family together and, and supporting people in whatever way they need to be supported. And I think that's the culture we need to get to. Mm. There's a question here from um, Nabila Khan um, asking everyone, a uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon has um, had a two-year gap because of her baby and now has gone into a depression um, because uh, she misses her work and asking if there are comments from the panel about what to do. I think, Deborah, you commented in the answer, but um, if you want to elaborate. I think, isn't that tragic, really, that we aren't keeping, so our, the UK support program that Zoe mentioned does have the keeping in touch. And, you, you know, even if you can't plan your, your time off, you should be keeping in touch and that uh, there should be a sort of a maybe a plan for your return. Now, obviously, if you don't know when you're going to come back, as Scarlett maybe didn't, then it's difficult, isn't it? But the fact that you're not being, people aren't keeping in touch, that's really a, a great shame. And uh, I would like to see that we could help you, Nabila, to, to, to work with your team to keep in touch, because it is very miserable if what keeps you going, and I know it isn't just work that keeps us going, it's life as well. But if one of those things goes, then you, you feel a lesser person sometimes, and that's very dispiriting, and uh, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. I think, I think uh, one thing, uh, the, 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 this, this was a very insightful comment, and uh, one thing that, we, we need to talk a little bit about is also shame. Uh, so we talk about the um, not the, the 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 people that took time off to to come back. They're a little bit ashamed that uh, maybe they need to work on their skills and they have like residents that just brand new. And why am I here? I'm like 40 with those 30 year olds, and this is very this shame that people feel, but that they don't talk about it. It's very it's very interesting to to hear. Uh, in Brazil, our association we we had a prog we have a program to w help women to get board certified, and a lot of them that do not have board certification is because of they took time off for for maternity leave, and now they're ashamed to do the test again and to study or to discuss this. So so we made a group for them to be completely open and and feel safe to share their experience and their difficulties so we can try to help them but this topic of like feeling guilty or shameful because you're not up to date or you need to take extra time it's it's something that it needs to be normalized we're all humans what, I think there's still a huge yeah. amount of stigma about taking time out um, for whatever reason it is and when you return and I was speaking to a colleague who'd done a PhD and after he returned um, he'd had three three years out and when he returned everyone said oh you probably can't even remember which way to hold the knife and things like that so there's a lot of it's, it's sort of banter but also low grade harassment really isn't it um, mm -hmm. And you can see why when people experience even little throwaway comments like that, it becomes very difficult for people to want to return. Olaf, you took uh, a little bit of time because of your PhD as well, but you can also explain how it works in here because uh, people take time for their PhDs, but they're not completely off uh, from, from the clinic, are they? No, in, in Sweden we, we can, um, I mean, some people will do it full time, but, but uh, for us usually it's uh, something that you do on your spare time, on uh, evenings and, and uh, weekends, and um, uh, yeah, it can go on for a long time. <laughs> uh, but I try to, to focus on that f for a while, while teaching uh, medical students as well, yeah. Yes. So we have more questions uh, from Claire uh, Murnagnan 
uh, sorry if I mispronounce. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks uh, to everyone. May I ask uh, Scarlett uh, if she feels it was more difficult to return to work during COVID restrictions due to limited elective operations and hence fear of becoming de-skilled uh, due to loss of opportunities while, sh while still having to train others? Um, thank you. Um, I actually, as I said, working from home was great for me because it meant that I could go at my pace um, because I was clinically extremely vulnerable and couldn't go in during the lockdowns. Um, but then after I'd had two vaccinations and an antibody test showing that I've made good antibodies to the vaccination, I went back in as soon as I possibly could, which was possibly a little bit too early. Um, but I didn't feel de-skilled. I didn't, um, but then I've been doing this for a long time, but I there are some things that once you've done them once, you can always do them. Um, and some things, it, you know, it feels worse when you're out. And then once you're back in, it just is so natural. You know what comes next. Um, and, you know, you can look at videos, you can read books and all that stuff, but actually just back in there doing it, it, it it's fine. The, the, um, and I was actually more fortunate than my colleagues because um, my elective, um, work is is mostly hand surgery and that's uh, nearly all day case quite a lot local anesthetic and I could pick people off lists when I was just building up to reskill um, and some of my colleagues in East Sussex have had patients cancelled because there isn't an overnight bed um, whereas my, my list kept on going and then I could pick out ones that I wanted to do um, and also I haven't got an allocated registrar at the moment I do everything myself including the paperwork and everything um, but it means if someone wants to work with me, they choose to work with me. They say, you know, I want to do some Jupitrons or I want to do, you know, need to get my carpal tunnel numbers up or whatever it is. They can choose to come and then we do it as a training list. It's, it's, um, so it's easier for me. I'm not having to supervise someone when I'm getting back to work myself, as it were. I, uh, just coming back to what you um, said, Scarlett, about um, having done everything so many times before, I think there is a huge difference in how experienced you are when you come back to work. So when you're a very junior registrar, it's sometimes difficult because um, everything is new, but then also there's a lower expectation. Um, mm. I took time out in the middle of my registrar years, which I found a lot easier than coming back into my more senior years. Um, where the I'm a lot more is expected of me, but I don't have the same experience that I do if I was, you know, at your stage. Um, and also still doing a lot of different procedures and different specialties. So I haven't really got my techniques really honed on on any of those individual specialties. Trauma is a bit different because we do so much of it, but um, elective operating I think is quite challenging to come back to and and feel familiar with if it's not something that you've got many years experience of. Any comments? Uh, uh, a, a comment Jennifer Cherry has uh, put a couple questions in and maybe to feed off of what you just said Zoe um, it says what are your thoughts on being labeled the struggling trainee on return to work from a career break and the associated stigma and emotional impact of this, do we need to have flexibility to add time to ease back into training without the stigma of that sort of label of the struggling uh, trainee? And Jennifer also mentioned that uh, she thought that maybe the fact that we have COVID and, and everybody's had to sort of come back from a break, so to speak, maybe gives people more empathy um, uh, for those who have actually taken a, an actual planned or unplanned career break. So. So any, any comments about that or anyone else? Well, I, I would say that in, in mid-COVID, when our purely elective hospital had to become a trauma unit, so the hip replacement surgeons had to actually do a fractured neck of femur, <laughs> that caused a lot of stress, I can tell you. <laughs> you know, and apart, I mean, it's everything else as well, but it was interesting to see that some surgeons went back to their roots and thought, oh, yeah, let me at it, that would be fine. And others were thinking, oh my goodness, that's similar, but entirely different. So I think you're quite right, Vicky, that there is, um, yeah, it, it affects everyone in different different ways. But I think as we were discussing the other day, I, I, this, this concept that you're struggling um, just because you're not quite up to speed is, is really, we, we're just using all the wrong words for a lot of these things. And the trouble is any word we come up with won't be quite right. 
So, you know, my kids with disabilities in my career time, they've had endless different words to describe them. And then the word changes because it's not acceptable anymore. So you have to find another word. So the words are important, I think, um, but our actions are probably the more important thing. So we should not be seen to be unsupportive of our struggling uh, trainees. I think it says a lot of uh, of the culture uh, as well, because I, I I mean, back in Brazil we had that. Here in Sweden is completely different, and I'm not saying like we don't have problems here in Sweden, because of course we do. But it's 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 so how how society works and how the culture is. It impacts so much in the more aspects of our lives than uh, than I realize. So it's interesting. I have a question or uh, and a, and a comment. You know, some of these things are structural and um, anyone that's working in an academic center, you take time off for parental leave or, or anything else. Um, your ability to move up the promotion scale um, is inhibited. And without a conscious effort on the part of the institution, to accommodate for the fact that perhaps women have the greater share of childcare responsibilities or someone is um, ill. Um, do other people in other countries have uh, their institutions that allow for an extra year to be considered for promotion or allow for that flexibility? We, we at, where I work at uh, University of Pennsylvania, you can petition for uh, you know, an extension in the time that it takes to get promoted um, so that you're not penalized. But how does it work to get promoted in the U.S., th though? Like, do you have to wait a, a, a specific amount of time to, to be promoted? How, so Usually in the United States, it's based on um, your dossier or your, your record um, of scholastic activity or teaching um, or clinical excellence. So it's I think probably every institution is a little bit different, but um, it's hard to be productive uh, in a scholarly way if you're out um, taking care of a child or a family member or you're ill. So, you know, it means that you sometimes drop off of that upward trajectory of um, scholastic activity. So, again, allowing people that flexibility um, is important. Otherwise, you end up further behind. Again, this affects most people the people are who are in an academic environment, not so much the same private practice. I'm curious as to what others have seen. We need to make structural barriers go away. The UK is, um, for a long time has said it's at your stage, not your age. And therefore, you know, you are that implies that time out for any reason did not affect your career progression. Again, that's not always, that doesn't always happen quite like that. But uh, I think we're better than some places at trying to maintain that stage is what we look for. And in fact, you know, when you're looking at promotions, you're not allowed to know person's age. That's taken off. Um, now you can find out. But I mean, it does make it difficult. And of course, you know your, your colleagues well. But it's Hey, it, it helps. It's a start. It's a start. From a trainee point of view, the curriculum has recently changed in the UK, um, whereas it used to be um, far more time based. It's now competency based. Um, that's a recent change that's come in this year. So it'll be interesting to see how that impacts on um, training progression. Yeah, in Nigeria, it's a bit, um, uh, it's part of the same thing. When it comes with the residents and then the um, um, the consultants. For the residents, the promotion, you have to pass your exams. When you pass, you're promoted. Um, but the consultants, it's about um, time. There's a period of time based on um, what you're supposed to do. And then when the time comes, you get promoted. Now, whether you have your maternity leave there um, during residency or as a consultant, once you're done, the time you took for your maternity leave, you take that same time to prepare for exams or prepare for whatever it is you want to do. And then you get promoted. So it's more like about utilizing the time after the maternity leave and then prepare for your exams and then you can get your promotion once you pass your examination. But the consultants and your competency and all that that is involved to 
promoted. It's just a matter of um, time. With five years, you must stop for five years and then get a promotion. Olaf, would you like to talk uh, how is it in Sweden? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think I don't think your your time off being on parent leave is it doesn't count for anything uh, in Sweden. Uh, that's the next step, next level, perhaps, um, because uh, you do something for your society, I suppose. But, but uh, in terms of promotion, in, I think you need a certain amount of time and a certain level to. to uh, so so you will uh, be set back by parent leave, of course. That's the risk. We have um, just a few minutes at the end. I thought it might be nice if we just went around the panel um, and asked um, just maybe thoughts about um, your, your best advice if someone who ends up on a career break. You've, you've mentioned it in your talks, but if you could just summarize in a couple sentences, what is your, your best advice to someone who either has a planned or unplanned uh, career break, um, just so we can hear your final thoughts. Who wants Deborah to start? Oh, that is, that is, uh, so I would say be kind to yourself uh, and you know those around you, and uh, keep in touch, and um, see what you want to get out, out of your break and what you don't want to get out of your break. So if you want to keep in touch and do a bit of work or a bit of a project, then I'm sure we'd like to think we can help you if you have to or want to take total time off, then that's absolutely fine. But just keep in touch on a friendly basis. I would say um, seek out people who have gone th through something similar and um, who can share their experiences with you. And also find bosses who will be supportive of uh, your return and will supervise you adequately uh, when you come back. Yes, I agree. I think it's important to uh to when you get back to be open about what you're nervous about or what you feel is difficult and uh, so then you can get support the right way. I would say uh, be organized and plan and as much as you can look into work and before you get back to work. Yeah and I was going to say all of that um, it's about being kind to your future self. It's kind of knowing what you ought to be doing and how you can fit that in and then dropping things you don't want to do. Um, and your first plan might not be your best plan. Um, it's just how it feels and then you might have to change. Wonderful. Well, um, Camilla, I'll leave you, leave you to, to wrap up the session and uh, thanks to everybody. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to participate here in this uh, symposium, this webinar with us. Uh, it's a, it's a very, very important discussion, and I hope this uh, starts a conversation in uh, in different countries, in different settings, and uh, we can learn from each other and uh, and improve how we work and in our societies. Why not? Thank you. Bravo. Right on time. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. We will. We Thank will. Thank you. How do we?